Thank you very much for inviting me, of course. It's an enormous privilege. Late in my life, a little late to, to for the first time, visit Vancouver. So I will ask you also your indulgence, and I hope you will not find me arrogant to sometime make statement about Vancouver, a city I know very little. I've been there exactly eight days. But uh, in my visit, I was always escorted, thanks to Sam, with extremely competent people, where whenever we walked through the cities, and I was kind of surprised of certain things, they would exactly tell me what happened. Uh, this is tall because there was a change of zoning at this, this state, but it has changed after, or something like that. And so I... I think I learned a lot, uh, given the little time I had. Uh, so I, I will not, certainly not tell you what you should do. Uh, that would be terrible. I don't believe in that. I will just uh, compare Vancouver to other cities I know and look at the constraint and the, the assets that Vancouver have. And then I will compare that to what I understand are your regulations. And, and from there, try to find why uh, a possible explanation for the very high housing cost that uh, people who come to Vancouver, the new generation, are in country. And again, here, it's just, uh, it's not a diagnosis, really. It's just that. Uh, if you have those elements together, this is what's likely to happen. And so it, it, what to do after that will be, of course, up to you. But I think that, uh, as Sam mentioned, to keep the quality of life of this city in the long run, you need to do quite a lot of things. So let us start now. One of the fundamental things after studying, again, many cities around the world, is to find that cities are before all a labor market. Now, most people like you and me, who absolutely love cities, if not, you will not be there, uh, consider that there is much more in a city than just to go to work and back home. True, of course. But all the things we need about cities all the things we like about cities, like meeting friends in a restaurant or a cafe, going to concert, uh, jogging along the shore, or going to a museum, going to exhibition, all these things are possible only if there is a very healthy labor market which supports all those things. And so when you are an urban planner, you have first to be sure that this labor market works. What are the elements of this labor market? What is important? First, to realize that this labor market has to be integrated. That means that if somebody is coming to Vancouver, it's not to work within five minutes from his or her home, but it's by looking at all the jobs available in Vancouver, and among all these jobs, select the one which is the right one at your own time in life. Later, you may want to change, and maybe you change again. And this is possible and better in a large city. You have a, a, a much better chance of finding your ideal job. Your ideal job, by the way, at a certain time of your life. You know, when you are just out of college, your ideal job might be very different from, for instance, my ideal job at 84. Uh, so this possibility of changing jobs, this possibility of having a large choice of jobs, is what is, makes large cities much more productive than smaller ones. In spite of, uh, for instance, the congestion, maybe even the highest crime that you will find, uh, or maybe even uh, in the case of COVID, maybe a higher transmission of uh, illness that you can find in a city. You know, this ability 
to find the right job for you as an individual, the ability for firms to come to Vancouver because they are confident that whatever their business, they will be able to find the people who have a specialty which will correspond to what they need. This is the strength of cities. And so what planners have to do there? The first thing is to have a transport system which allow anybody to go from one part of the metropolitan area to another randomly in less than one hour. If you commute more than one hour, and one hour the maximum, that means that, let's say, the median would be around 30 minutes. Uh, if you commute more than a longer time, uh, your own productivity, your family life, your ability to do other things than working will be greatly impeded. And, and it is what I, you know, I have found a case in South Africa many years ago it was a case study of a woman who was, she has been fully employed. Her salary was one and a half times the minimum wage. She was cleaning offices. But she had a, a nice house, by the way, given practically free by the government, but it was a nice house. She didn't have to pay much rent for it. So by any, any definition, she was not poor, not at all, but, a total commuting time every day was five hours, two and a half hours to go, two and a half hours to come back. This to me is a new poor, the new proletariat, and we have to pay attention to that. So our traditional statistics will establish poverty by the income or even having no house. Here is a person who has a house, was a regular income but he's more poor than the poor because it's five hours. So I think that this is what the planners have to, uh, have to look at and try to solve the problem. They have to monitor the commuting time of every worker in the city. And as you cannot do it individually, you can do it by neighborhood. If you live in this neighborhood, with the existing transport system, how many jobs can you access? Now, you will tell me some people, uh, you know, if, uh, for instance, they, uh, they will not be interested in the job in a lawyer's office because they are not qualified. Or whether this is a mistake. Of course, they will not uh, become a corporate lawyer if they just came out of high school. But probably, whenever, wherever there is a corporate lawyer, there is also a restaurant. There's also somebody cleaning office. There's somebody who is connecting computers together. There's an electrician, there is a plumber. So really what is important is that you can access from any point of the city in less than one hour any other area of the city. This is the, the, the first rule of thumb, the golden rule actually of the urban planner. The second rule is that whatever your job, whatever your salary, you should have access to land and housing somewhere in the city, again, at less than one hour to the job market. So these, for me, are the two golden rules. After that, of course, a city has to look at other things like uh, refuse disposal, uh, health, education. Those things are, of course, very important. But do not forget that if the labor market doesn't work, that means bad affordability, bad transport, you will not have the resources to pay for education, for garbage removal, or for health, or anything else, or for culture. So the first thing is to ensure that the foundation of the city are working well. So that's what I mean by cities as labor market. So let us look very quickly what I mean in a more concrete sense uh, on the pattern of commuting. You know, I've said that commuting in less then one hour is the most important thing. What do I mean here? So here I have a graph of uh, four imaginary cities. It's, it's very uh, schematic. So the first one here on, on the left, the monocentric model, uh, it's, a, it's a classical model that economists are using. You assume that most of the jobs and amenities are in the center of the city. Uh, around the city center, the density are high, they decrease toward the suburbs, and then people basically commute 
from the suburbs or the central city toward the, the concentrated zone of, uh, zone of employment. Uh, this model still exists in cities which are usually uh, have a population of less than a million people. After the population increase above a million, it's become a little more complex. We'll see that. Uh, what is interesting in this model, of course, is that uh, for transport, it's relatively easy to establish a heavy transit system because although the origin of trips are dispersed, the destination are concentrated. So you could have a line of subways or buses feeding subways, uh, which uh, bring, it's relatively easy to use uh, public transport. The second model is uh, the, what I call the dispersed model, which emerged in North America uh, the, the typical example is Los Angeles or Atlanta or, or Houston, where you don't have a center. You, you have a, a center of gravity of the city. You have a centroid of the shape of the city. But the number of jobs in this centroid, which is more accessible than the rest, are very small compared to the other. Uh, in Los Angeles, practically, uh, you know, the, what is called the center of the city do not contain, if I remember well, more than six or seven percent of all the jobs. So the jobs are practically entirely dispersed. So then, and, and the city emerged when Americans could afford individual cars. So you end up with this type of shape of commuting where you have dispersed origin and dispersed destination. And this is why it is so difficult in uh, Los Angeles or Atlanta to develop a subway system or any type of uh, transport. So everybody's fighting against cars, uh, and cars are very inefficient means of urban transport. You know, they, they were designed to, to bring your family to a picnic on Sunday uh, near a lake or something, but they are not very good at uh, commuting within the city. So, but the car we have are designed that way. They are, they are, they are too heavy, they are probably they go too fast, uh, and uh, but that's the only one we have so far. Fortunately, I think for the first time in 100 years, we have a, the possibility of a, an urban transport revo revolution, uh, either with electric bicycle, uh, Uber, maybe uh, a transit system with small vehicles which could be on demand without a driver. That means that it will reduce very much the cost of vehicles. There are a number. I don't know which one will win of all that. I don't know. Probably a combination of two. You know, the idea that uh, you have only the car or the transit uh, should not. You should have probably in a modern city which is large. You you should have for one trip maybe a combination of two or three means. For instance, uh, having a, a light vehicle to go to the station, take a station, a rapid train, and there again have a light vehicle which bring you from the station to the door where you want to go. Now, there are many, many different systems uh, being invented those days. What uh, the transport authorities should do, instead of defending their small niche, saying we want to encourage people to use buses or we want to encourage people to use subway, they should say we want to encourage people to use the most efficient way of getting around which is slightly different, you know, and I see that all the time, that every company, whether it's Uber or whether it is a, a transit authority, try to maximize their little niche of the market instead of looking at what is the best to go in less than one hour from one part of the city to the other. Now, the, the third model is the composite model, which is the most common, which I believe correspond to Vancouver, uh, the same as it corresponds to Paris or New York or London. So in fact, the, it's a superimposition of the two first model. You have a city center, like you have here in, uh, in Vancouver, with a lot of concentration of jobs. You have also a lot of amenities. You have more restaurants or, or theater uh, you know, in the city center, which attract people. But you have also jobs which have dispersed in the in the suburbs. And my experience all over the world, there is one rubble, you know, in my long career that I have observed that 
even the cities which have a high, very high concentration of jobs and amenity in the center, over time, those jobs dispersed. A city like Paris, which has a, a center, by the way, heavily subsidized by the central government, all the taxpayer of France, you know, to maintain the monuments, to main, you know, the theater in Paris are all subsidized by the taxpayer. So in spite of this concentration, high concentration of job too, if you look at metropolitan Paris, which is now about 10 million people, 70% of the commuting trips are between suburbs to suburb. That means that the job have uh, you know, dispersed around the suburb. And only 30% are either within historical Paris, you know, the central Paris, or are from suburbs to Paris. So you see the, the, the centrality is disappearing over, over time because a lot of employers find land or, or rent in the central city too expensive or sometimes they split their firm into two parts. Uh, the corporate part stay the prestigious building in the center, but a lot of employees are put in the suburbs where rents are much cheaper. So this, we have to face this. By the way, uh, strangely enough, New York metropolitan area with a 20 million uh, people, so double the size of Paris in terms of metropolitan, you, by chance, you have exactly the same proportion. 30% of the workers uh, are going to Manhattan or are living in Manhattan and working in Manhattan, and 70% are traveling from suburbs to suburbs. So you see, this is a trend which is worldwide. Uh, I, you have the same study for Bangkok, Shanghai, or things like that. It's a world trend. There's not much you can, well, you should not do anything about it because this is the choice of firms and people to live in certain things. You know? So, and then the last one is a, it's a form of city that I see all the time in master plans, I have never seen them in reality. <laughs> so it's something which exists in the mind of urban planner because if it could exist, it would be wonderful. It means that here, you do not have a labor market anymore. You have 20 labor markets. Everybody, you know, the planners are so smart that they put the, the job you want right at a walking distance from your house. <laughs> and therefore, no need of transit, no need of uh, transport, no pollution, no carbon emission. It's a wonderful thing. I compare it to a, a flying carpet. You know, a flying carpet is a wonderful means of transport. Doesn't cut too much, it's comfortable. Uh, you can fold it in your office, use it at any time, it's wonderful. It doesn't exist. Uh, so, and you, you will see that in urban planning, we have a lot of flying carpets. <laughs> you know, for instance, say, using rent control in order to reduce rent, to make uh, uh, housing affordable, is a flying carpet. You know, it sounds wonderful, you know, everybody could have, but in the long run, it never runs, it never works. It has never reduced the price of housing. So, let us look now at Vancouver. So again, forgive me to, for talking about Vancouver while being completely ignorant, but you know, a lot of people do that. <laughs> so here, what uh, intrigued me about Vancouver, so it's a circle of 25 kilometer uh, radius uh, around the city center of Vancouver. And what struck me immediately when I saw Vancouver was that the amount of water close to the center, you run into water all the time, it's very beautiful, and the mountains too. Very few cities in the world have both mountain and water. Usually you have water or you have mountain. Very rarely you have two. And that's, of course, the fantastic charm of Vancouver. Uh, at the same time, what does it mean? It means that a lot of the land is not developable. So if you compare yourself to a city like Houston or Dallas, which is on a flat plain with no interest whatsoever, uh, 
well, they, they may have good restaurants, but... Uh, uh, and uh, so you have, within 25 kilometers, much less land. That means that you have to use this land very carefully. And then I look at uh, land use regulation, and I was briefed, well, I, I start studying them. Sam sent me some documents before, so I start reading them. And then during my visit, uh, I, you know, I saw, I was given explanation about floor ratio, setbacks, things like that. And, uh, and I found that strange, you know, while you have this enormous constraint on the quantity of land, which is developable, at the same time, you have regulations which force you to consume more land than you will want. You know, after all, what is a floor ratio? You know, if, if, if the floor ratio tell you two, that means that the legislator thinks that if you were left to your own wishes, maybe you will use three. And they say, this is not good. You have to consume more land. And, and they force you to consume more land, although there is a shortage of land. So it's a bit like, you know, some cities have a shortage of water. For instance, uh, uh, Beijing, you know, Beijing, uh, all the water in Beijing now is coming from 3,000 kilometers from the south of China, you know, enormous pipeline. So it's very expensive. So imagine that you had a regulation in Beijing which forced you to say, well, you have to consume at least 250 liters per capita per day. If you consume less, you, you, you will not be allowed to have a connection. So it's a bit what our regulation are doing. Now, it's not only that, but also I believe that in any city, because when a city develops, people change, income change, technology change. So within the city, there is a change of structure already. But you know, new business are coming, which didn't exist before. At the same time, a city is always confronted to external shocks, like the COVID, for instance, was a good example of it. Uh, or inflation is an external shock. Uh, the price of energy comes up and down, and a city has to adjust to those changes. Any city which stays in the same situation is doomed. You know, if you, for instance, some, some country subsidizes energy very heavily because the, the, when the price of energy goes up, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's painful, the adjustment is painful. In the long run, they are destroying their own country by doing that because they are spending uh, more uh, subsidy on energy than on education and health. So in the long run, those, those countries are doomed to poverty. So the essence of a city is to adjust. And you have to have confidence that people, including all the individuals who, uh, who are in the city, left to themselves, if the price are right, if the price are right, are not subsidized, that they will eventually adjust to those ex external shocks. Now, let's get back to land use. The way I understand it, there are some areas of the city, which are, by the way, pretty close to the city center, which were developed 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago, and the land, the, the, the land use, the land, the way it was used 40 years ago is frozen as it was there. It cannot be recycled. So this, again, is a rigidity which costs a lot to the city. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that the city should have a, an urban renewal program and, and build those uh, you know, single-family housing because they are not... Uh, you know, if anybody wants to stay in a single family house in the very center of the city, I have no problem with that, of course. Uh, you know, I believe very much in, in the, the right. I don't think the government will intervene. But should the, should the government force people to consume more land than they want by putting it into a regulation? You know, if it's an individual choice, there is no problem. You know, you do what you want with your money. If you want to spend on, uh, you know, 80% of the price of your house on land, this is your business. There is no problem with that. But should the government tell you that you should spend 80% of the price of housing on, on land and not on construction? So that's where I have a problem with the, the, the freezing of regulation. I think, uh, basically, to simplify a bit my position, is that 
I think that anything which is consumption, consumption of land or floor space, should be left to the individual or the firm to decide the location, how much land they want to consume in this location, how much floor space they want to consume in this location. Regulations are useful to enforce contract. You know, you cannot have anarchy for fire regulation because while you can, anybody can see how much land is on a lot and how much floor space there is, uh, very few people can assess uh, what are the, the fire resistance of a building unless the government has not, uh, not put a rating or the fire marshal has not. So there are certain things like that that has to be regulated, cannot be left to the market, it, now, I'm not saying that, by the way, those regulations should not be revised from time to time, but they have to be revised by experts. It's not a, you know, it's not a consumer who can decide, uh, you know, or, uh, or a staircase uh, should be built uh, in case of fire. There's no way we can do that. But anything which is consumption should be left to the individual. In the same way as uh, when we, t you know, we all know that some food is more healthy than other, and that some quantity of food, you know, if you eat too much, not so good. If you eat too little, it's not so good. However, we do not conceive a government will force us to have a certain type of food every day in a certain quantity. So I think that uh, this uh, this choice of the consumer is very important. So now, uh, when I. So that, so I, I measure what, uh, what was left for developable land when you remove the water and the mountain from this circle of 25 kilometers. Now, when I do that, I found the buildable area with only 39%. 39% of this land is developable. The rest is not. Uh, therefore, you know, you have to save on land. You have to audit. You know, what I suggest, you know, right now, I, I was aware that there were discussions in the assembly uh, about, in some area, putting duplex, quadruplex. This is all good and well. It's certainly, you know, to increase, uh, you know, decrease, in fact, the, the amount of land you spend to build one square meter of floor space is a good idea. But, I think that the problem is so serious, especially when I see that, you know that uh, Vancouver, when you, when you measure the price income ratio, that means the, the number of years of income that you have to spend to buy a house, that's a price income ratio, it has one of the world record with 12, the, the, the ratio is 12. Uh, I think they are only in the in the survey which contained the 84 of the richest city in the world. Uh, there are only two cities which have a higher price income ratio. So you have a record record of the most expensive housing in the world in the rich world. So I think you have to do something about it. And uh, now, after I did that, Sam told me, well. You had forgotten something. And that was agricultural land reserve. Now, again, I have no, I have nothing against agriculture. It's a good thing. Um, I think that depending on where the agricultural land is located, it might not be a good idea to keep it agricultural for one good reason, is that agriculture usually needs investment in labor, in particular in irrigation and labor, and usually um, if you are close to a city, uh, most, labor, most uh, labor will have the higher wages if they work as electrician or plumber in construction than if they work in the field. Uh, and that was, this idea uh, was reinforced when I read yesterday, I think, or this morning, that uh, some people were very unhappy about the way land was used in the agricultural reserve 
they discovered that uh, most of people now were using it to um, to uh, to cultivate marijuana, you know, that, uh, or or in the past apparently a golf course, which is not normally in agricultural use. You know, you you, you don't get your bread from golf course. Um, so you see, this show this uh, dichotomy between coloring a plan, saying this is all green, therefore it's going to remain agricultural, and the economy of the country where it doesn't make much sense to cultivate something uh, within the reach of a subway you know, or, or a sewer system. You have invested in this infrastructure and this infrastructure. Now, what is interesting too is that the only way Vancouver can expand in south and well, well southeast, and it happened, of course, that all this agricultural land uh, is in the southeast. And so you see, you have here area which are developable, but they are very fragmented. That means that if you develop a sewer system or transport, you know, heavy rail or something it will be very uneconomical. You have to go through the agricultural land or go around it, which will be even worse. So you, you really paralyze uh, ex uh, you know, the extension of the city. One way, of course, to deal with this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this restriction on land would be to develop very, very fast uh, transport system, a bit like the maglev, you know, in, uh, in Singapore, uh, sorry, in uh, Shanghai, uh, the maglev goes from the airport to, well, uh, to Pudong, not quite the center of the city, at uh, 400 kilometer an hour. So I'm not saying you should develop a maglev, but say something very fast like that, combined with another means of transport for the last two or three kilometers from the station to where you want to go, will be a way of dealing with this uh, land use constraint due to water and mountain. But if on top of that, you have, you have the land reserve and this uh, seriously has to be cultivated, uh, I don't think you have a chance. So, see this says, if I take into account the, uh, the ALR uh, in things, then it's not 39% which is buildable, it's only 33%. That means only one third. This is London, so the, the center of the circle is Trafalgar Square, and the 25 kilometer radius corresponds, you know, here on the to uh, uh, to the airport, you know, um, Israel Airport. So you see, then the constraint of water is the same, and and there are also some some lake in the north. You see, this is uh, I didn't even measure them. It's a really very, very little, probably maybe two or three percent of the land is not developable. Now, uh, of course, planners are not happy with abundance, so they, uh, they created a, a green belt uh, around London to make sure that the prices are going up, uh, you know, or, or people commute longer because they have to live beyond the green belt. So, so that's, uh, but say, uh, relatively, you could deal with the green belt, again, they complain that the green belt is full of uh, golf course, and uh, I've, I don't know about marijuana yet. But uh. <laughs> so this this is just to show you in a, I would say a disadvantage because your topography is also an enormous asset, but in terms of housing affordability, yes, it is a disadvantage. So you have to deal with this land, you know, the, the economy of land in a very very uh, you know, detailed manner. Now, here I have a graph which horizontally we have household yearly income. Uh, that was, by the way, it's a bit old. It was Vancouver 215. Uh, and uh, the, so I cut it by uh, increment of $5,000 uh, a year so that we have a complete and vertically, by the way, we have the number of households. So here, you have the entire population of Vancouver by, by household, and you have their income. So now on that, 
you add the number of building permits every year, and you know the building permits, you know how much the houses cost. So you could distribute those building permits on a graph like that, and you could see which, which uh, part of the population have access to housing on the market, which are priced on the market. Now, you have a lot of programs which are, uh, you know, what, what they call strangely affordable housing, which precisely means housing is not affordable, and that the government or the taxpayer has to pay for it, or maybe the, the people who buy housing have to pay for the people who, are, who want affordable housing. I mean, it's a strange uh, uh, way of calling things, but... Uh, and uh, so you could put all those programs there. You know, the number, you know, look at all the, the uh, you know, the cooperative, the, you know, and all the units which are built, they are built and they have a, a sale price, whether it's market or whether it's affordable. Uh, they have a, and you can put it on this graph and then you see what is missing. And you see what, what happens when you don't produce enough housing for a category in particular, those category here, let's say below 30,000. And you see, if you have a household who get 40,000 a year, is prob the problem of this household is very different from the one of 2,000. Also, because you have so many programs to subsidize housing in different ways, it will be very difficult, very important to put it there to see what do they achieve, which are the group would benefit the most. My guess, I don't know, I have not done it, but my guess is that you will find a lot of people are, are missing, more and more of those benefits are coming upstream. One of the things which I found interesting that I did in New York, in New York we have the same also affordable housing uh, program where whenever, uh, especially in Manhattan, you build a tower of apartment, 25% have to be affordable. That means the city decides what will be either the rent or the, the price, but usually the rent. And so the price is paid by the developer, so the developer is compensated by a higher floor ratio, which shows that the floor ratio in the first place was completely arbitrary, because uh, you know, if you can increase it when the city decides to do it, it means that it has no raison d'etre. So in a way, it encouraged the city to have a very restricted floor ratio, because any extra floor becomes very precious to any developer. So in a way, they have a monopoly for, uh, for all the extra floor which exists in Manhattan, and they sell it back to the developer uh, for cost subsidizing housing. Now, in, in New York, I found that the people who were cost subsidizing uh, so-called affordable housing were all located in the tail of the income here, and they represented, if I remember well, about 20% of the household, but they were subsidizing, they were supposed to subsidize something like 55% of the houses, of the household were entitled to this subsidy. So what happened? Uh, every time 120 apartments uh, in a project are produced as affordable housing, there is a lottery and uh, 420 dwelling units, there are about 150,000 people applying. Now, the lottery is not a housing system, you know, it's not. If you, if you are a school teacher and you are counting on that to be able to have a, uh, a house close to your school, or even half an hour from your school, uh, well, what do you do if you don't win the lottery? So you go back to another city. And my last slide is this one. It shows in three Canadian markets, Winnipeg, Toronto, and Vancouver, what is the proportion of the cost of a house, a, a single family house, uh, which will be 1,500 square feet? What is the cost of land as part of the price? And they find, you see that in Vancouver, they beat a record, a, a very large part of uh, the price of a house is land. Normally, in a normal market, which is you know, driven by the market, 
the price of land is 30 percent. It could be up to 40. Uh, it could be 25, but it's it's run into that. Uh, I'm not sure if if economists have a theory for that, but it's kind of a rule of thumb. So here you are far, far beyond. So this price of land is not surprising if you look at what we have seen before. Shortage of land because of the topography, uh, shortage of land because no recycling of land, which was zoned long ago for individual housing. And then, of course, uh, the equivalent of a green belt, in a way, uh, with uh, the restriction on agricultural land. So this is, let's say, the conclusion of my talk. I'm a bit over time. Uh, housing should be demand-driven, not supply-driven. It means it should not be the government who says, oh, we are going to build uh, 1,000 affordable housing next year. It should be supply. That means because you have the quantity of housing, the location, the, the let's say the quantity of floor space, the quantity of land, and the location, these are trade-offs that either household or firms have to do themselves. No planners know what is the best location for you and what is the best size for an apartment. A lot of people are making trade-offs. They are ready to live in a relatively small apartment in order to be close to the center or to the contrary, to they are They'd rather have a larger apartment or house farther away and then commute more. Those trade-offs are individuals. No urban planners know better than the household themselves. No, house, no urban planners know better than the firm themselves, where they want to locate how much land. So, thank you.